Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to talk about faith, but maybe in a little bit different way. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. We're going to talk about a lack of faith causes a rebuke. A lack of faith causes a rebuke. So, Pastor, that sounds a little judgmental. Well, every situation we're going to look at tonight is, involves Jesus Christ. So I think if Jesus rebukes, then I think God deems it worthy. Now, granted, that doesn't give us the right to go and rebuke people because they're lacking faith, and we'll get to that tonight. But you'll see that when it's us lacking faith, God may rebuke us, and that's right, righteous judgment. For him to say, come on now, where, oh, ye of little faith, where is your faith at? Come on, step it up. Get going, get to moving. You're to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, not stay in the same level of faith that you did when you first got born again. Yes, sir. And that's him being a loving God, Jesus Christ being that wonderful, loving, older brother to say, come on now, come on, get your act together. Come on, let's, we can do this. Amen. So Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So, Pastor, this has nothing to do with faith. Yes, it does. What, what Jesus Christ is saying to them, he says, look, you're going to have faith in one of them. You're not going to have faith in both of them. And whichever one that you truly serve is the one that you have full heart, faith, and confidence in. And see, that's the reason he says you can only serve one. You can't serve two. Because one of them is going to get neglected. One of them is going to have to take a back seat. That means you really don't serve that master. But verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? Isn't it more than food? And the body more than raiment or the clothing? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? He says, aren't you better than any bird of the air? Aren't you better than these animals that were created? He says, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? <laughs> which one of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his height? Now, if you could do that by worrying, I would have added to my stature a long time ago. Five, seven, that's roughly... I want to say average, maybe just a little bit shorter than average. But being, in, especially in high school, I would have worried a lot and thought, t taken thought, King James, would have taken thought to it to add more to my stature to make me a little taller. But I am what I am. Don't really care about it. Amen. I found that I'm right in the sweet spot because I'm not too tall that I have to duck or I can, you know, have to scrunch into things. But I'm not too short that I, you know, get a lot of short jokes either. So I'm right in that little sweet spot. Amen. <laughs> but with this, we can see that Jesus is saying, which one of you can really do anything about your physicality? Which one of you can really do it on your own by worrying about it, by putting thought into it, by just worrying yourself to death, we'll say, having those issues? Which one of you can really do anything on your own? Then verse 28 says, and why take, and why take ye thought for raiment? Why are you worrying about your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. They were not clothed like, he was not clothed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, is, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now, you can see that Jesus is already saying, oh, ye of little faith. Why? Because when you serve two masters, your mind is split, your faith is split, and so you're, you're trying to please both and you can't do it. One of them is going to win. So which one are you going to serve? Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve mammon? Are you going to serve God, the house of God? Are you going to serve God's kingdom or are you going to serve 
your job, you're going to serve the things that were that would try to get you monetary things or try to get you earthly things. Because really that's the heart of what Jesus is talking about in verse 24. But then he leads into why don't take thought of these things. Don't take thought of what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what clothes you're going to have. Don't worry about these things. Because when you worry about it, it changes nothing. But following God, God will supply all of your needs. There's been time and time again where Miss Tiffany and I were like, well, you know, we, we feel like we need to give into this offering. We feel like we need to do this. We feel like we need to do that. Or it was just maybe the, the, we didn't work as many hours at that current time, so we, are, we didn't get as much pay. We're like, all right, we're, st- we're still following God. We're honoring Him, so the Lord's going to supply our need. And every single time the Lord came through. Every single time the Lord came through. Why? Because we put him first. We didn't worry about it. Now, did our minds say, well, it's, it's whatever. We're just going to live our life and not worry about the bank account. We're not going to worry about things. No, we were good stewards over what we had. But when it came down to it, we are like, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And the Lord always provided. The Lord still provides when there's things going on. I mean, you know, even so much we could even point out God's graffiti recently. Where there's things we had need of, and we said, man, we need this much money to pay for the food. We need this much money for whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, in a blink of an eye, somebody come up and say, I feel like I need to give this. Well, praise God, thank you. Then all of a sudden, you know, you go about your business, and then you go back and you see what was given, and you're like, oh my word, that's exactly what we had need of. That's exactly what we did to the T, the dollar amount of what we needed, and here it is in our hand. Because God is that faithful. Amen. So for us, Jesus is, Jesus is saying that exact same thing. We don't worry about these things. Yes, be a good steward over what you have. Yes, take care of yourself. Yes, do these things. But don't worry about it. Don't be putting all this thought of, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. This has got to be just right, and I got to do this, and I should probably do this. No, no, no. Don't, don't, have, add that, don't add that stress to your life, and don't worry about it in that regard. Put faith and trust in God. Be a good steward of what you've got. Put your faith in Him. I mean, that's like for even our walk with God is we do what we can to stay away from sin, to stay away from these things, stay away from those things. And when we do falter, when we do fall, we say, Lord, please forgive me. Cleanse me. Help me. Help me not go back to that, go back to that sin. He cleanses us. And we put our faith in Him and we keep marching. So even in that regard, we do what we can, but God's got to make up the rest through our faith. So, Jesus tells them, he says in verse 30, O ye of little faith, you're worried about your clothes, you're worried about all these things, you shouldn't be. O ye of little faith. Verse 31, Therefore take no thought. Now he's went from why take thought. Now in verse 31 he's saying it's a command. Take no thought. Saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with all shall we be clothed. For all of these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth what you have need of all these things. That you have need of all these things. Excuse me. So we can see that even verse 32, Jesus admits, he tells them, look, your heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. Well, if God knows it, I don't have to ask him. No, no, no. <laughs> That's not, not the way this works. Jesus even in even in John chapter 14, he talks about you ask the Father and, that, and it will be given unto you that the Father may be glorified through the Son. Why? Because your connection with Jesus Christ as your Savior and your prayers connecting through Jesus Christ up to God the Father gives glory to God the Father through Jesus Christ and comes back down into your life as a testimony. So we, we, are, st- we are to still ask what we have need of, but the Father already knows what we have need of. You know, there's, there's times when the boys are in need of something and they may, we'll say they, they know that we are in need of it, but if they don't ask, I'm not going to give it to them. Because if you don't have that, if you have that attitude of, well, they know what I need, they know what I need, so they're, they're going to provide it for me. That's a spoiled mentality. To just assume that somebody's going to bring you those things because they know that you have need of it. No, no, no. There's power in asking. The Word tells us to ask and you shall receive. It says to knock and it shall be opened. That means there's an action on our part 
And what does that entail? It not only entails the asking or the action to ask for it, but it's the faith in that the answer is coming. Amen. So the Father may know, but that's not exercising your faith. When the Father knows what you have need of, there's no faith on your part. But you asking, there's a faith that's exercising your faith, saying, Father, I have need of this. Could you please supply this need? And God says, well, sure, I'll take care of you. Because you've exercised your faith. You have that expectation, not a spoiled mentality, but an expectation of knowing that God's hearing what you're asking for and He's going to answer it. Which leads us to verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we know this verse very well. We quote this a lot. We've read it a lot. But it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. So that means that, and by reasoning here, <laughs> means you can seek other things, like seeking a job. Okay? Well, the job's good. The job will give you a paycheck. The job will provide in those areas, but you seek first the kingdom of God. Father, may you help me to find the job that I have need of. Find me where you, help me to find the job where you want me to be. And I know that you'll supply my needs. You'll take care. I'll get to work at my job. But Lord, I know it is you because I'm putting you first. I'm seeking you first. That you're the one supplying my need. You're the one that has blessed me with the job. You're the one that has given me health and strength to obtain wealth through my job. Through doing what I need to do. But it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. So that means that the two masters, even going back to verse 24, that the two masters, you seek God first. And then the other master gets the leftovers, if that makes sense. Why? Because we build our faith in our God and not our job. We build our faith in God and not our own ability. We put our faith in Him first and foremost. But it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We've got to seek His righteousness, what's right according to Him. Then verse 34, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, so here he goes again, commanding, don't worry about these things. Don't trouble yourself. Don't worry about tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the, for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, or the trouble thereof. So we can see that we put all of our faith and trust in God, and He'll supply every need. But we've got to have our faith built up in Him. Because we can see... That even in verse 30, because the heart of what we're talking about tonight is a lack of faith causes a rebuke. So their lack of faith and worrying about all of these things from verses 24 all the way down through 30 causes Jesus to kind of go on this, I don't want to say tangent, but kind of go on this rebuke <laughs> session to say, oh, ye of little faith. Why are you worrying about this? Oh, ye of little faith. Don't you know that God can do more for you than he does for the lilies of the field, than he does for the fowls of the air? Don't you know that God will take more, better care of you than He will of those things? And so He says, O oh, you of little faith. Amen. So let's look at Matthew chapter 8. Flip over one page in my Bible. Matthew chapter 8. Forgive me. If you do want to write this down regarding Matthew chapter 6, you'll find the same, the same, the same situation in Luke 12. Verses 22 through 31. So going along with Matthew 6 is Luke 12, verses 22 through 31. So now leading us to Matthew 8, verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. In other words, Jesus is asleep. He's not worried about the storm. And his disciples came to him and woke, awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Jesus is not saying this because they woke him up. He's saying it because they're lacking faith in that where they're going, <laughs> that he, he knows that they're going to the other side. He knows they're going to make it. So when they are fearful and their faith is not set on making it to the other side that's what jesus rebukes oh you have little faith why are you afraid why are you scared and that's that's like there's been a few times 
You know, especially when uh, Pastor Chris and I went to Uganda to, uh, to preach and to teach SMTI, things of that nature. One of the, one of the things I was coming back on is we, when we split in, uh, I want to say it was Chicago, somewhere around in there. I was going up to Michigan and going on a, a few days family vacation before we went to the leadership conference. So I was heading up north. He was coming back home to south. And so when I get on the smaller plane to go to Traverse City, Michigan, it's snowing like everything. It's a little bitty small plane. And I'm thinking, hmm, okay, this should be interesting. So we get on the plane, and, then, and the, when we get up in the air, we hit a snowstorm. And it's like bad turbulence. I mean, it's just like jerking you all the way around. And l- women are screaming, let out blood-curdling like screams, and just, I mean, having a, having like, yeah, having issues trying to keep their sanity. Anyway, but I'm thinking, I'm like, Lord, I, I don't want to, I don't want to die. Then I thought, wait a minute, I just came from being in Uganda teaching the things of God. I'm going to spend time with my family, and I'm going to a leadership conference with God. I'm not going to die. The Lord's going to take care of me. Lord, you ordained this trip. You ordained us to go to the leadership conference. You've ordained all these things in my life. You're not going to let me fall now, <laughs> literally, in the this guy. You're not going to cause these issues. You're going to take care of me. So I began to pray in tongues. And it was like we hit a couple more bumps, and I just sat there in peace praying in tongues. And everybody else is, oh, and by the time we landed, they were like, oh, I'm so glad this flight is over. I'm thinking, I got peace. We could have flown another hour. It wouldn't have bothered me. But it's one of those things to where when I realized, wait a minute, why am I, why am I allowing this fear to creep up inside of me? Because I've got more faith in my God and Him taking care of me and what He's called me to do and the things I know He's not done with me yet. So my faith is in Him. But I did have that moment. I mean, being... You know, human, I had that moment of fear just kind of crept up over me. And I was like, oh man, oh man. But then I was like, wait a minute, come on now. Get a hold of yourself, man, come on. Ex-military, why are you being so fearful? <laughs> I'm serving the army of God now, praise God. Anyway, but the Lord took care of me and we had a wonderful time. And, but it's one of those things to where if we're, if we're not careful, our situations will creep up on us and cause a fear, but our faith must outdo our fear. Our faith must be able to speak to our fear. It says, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Notice what he rebukes first. His disciples. (laughs) He rebukes them before he does the storm. O ye of little faith. Why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? Really? How long must I be with you? (laughs) But then then he goes and rebukes the storm and puts everything at peace. Now, you can also find this passage or this same scenario in Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. So Mark 4, 35 through 41. And then also in Luke 8, 22 through 25. So it's found here in Matthew 8. It's also found in Mark 4, 35 through 41 and Luke 8. 22 through 25. Pastor, why are you giving us this? Because I'm wanting to make sure that you know everywhere that Jesus rebukes. Because if we're going to build a doctrine on Jesus saying, your little faith deserves a rebuke, then we need to be accurate in what we believe and knowing that we don't have one scripture that backs it up. We've got a multitude of these scriptures. So the disciples were afraid of the storms and they woke Jesus up. Before he speaks to the storms, he questions their faith. Now, here is the Condemning part. What do you mean by that, Pastor? This makes twice now we've seen in the book of Matthew. He says, oh, ye of little faith. Now, granted, if somebody is learning, you would not rebuke them. Like for different stages of life, you don't rebuke a kid when he's first learning, you know, how to walk. You don't rebuke him when he's learning how to talk. You don't, that's not how we say that. You need to say this clearly. Come on now, I know that you're like two years old, but you need to be able to say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Come on now. I mean, you wouldn't rebuke that. Why? That that makes no sense. So God does not rebuke us when he hasn't taught us yet or hasn't been able to express our faith or exercise our faith. So, all right, Pastor, what about right here? If you look back, you don't have to do it at this moment if you want to write this down. 
First of all, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. He taught them how to pray. So out of anything, before we even go any further, if anything were to come up and their faith was lacking, Jesus has already taught them how to pray. So they could have built their, their faith by praying to God, by talking to him and saying, all right, Father, all right, God, we're here. We're a little scared. We got this issue. We got these storms around us. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May you help us provide for this storm. Help us to provide peace in this storm. But that's not what they've done. They begin to worry and have fear because of their lack of faith. But not only that, he taught them on the word taking root from Mark 4. This is another reason why we give the other biblical accounts of this is because in the same chapter, before this happens in Mark 4, he talks to them and teaches them on the word taking root in their heart, on the word taking root in their life. So that makes two scenarios where Jesus is already like, come on now, I've taught you. I've taught you how to pray, and I've taught you about what I speak, the Word. And granted, they don't have the written Word like we do now for the Bible, but He's teaching on them. He's teaching them on how what He says and the things that He commands and His doctrine is to be in their life and is to help build their faith. And that's also in Luke 8. So before Mark 4 and Luke 8, in both of those, he taught on the word taking root in their life. And <laughs> the disciples learned to put their faith in Jesus by obeying him in Luke 5. So now, pulling all this together, he taught them how to pray in Matthew 6. He taught them how the word takes root in Mark 4 and in Luke 8. And the disciples also learned to put their faith in Jesus by obeying him in Luke 5. And well, what's that scripture about? Where to cast their nets. Now granted, they're, they're skilled fishermen. They're not just little amateurs. They're skilled fishermen. It's what they've done for a living. But yet when it comes to Jesus, because you know, he says, cast your net over there. And they say, well, we've been doing this all day long. We haven't caught anything. He says, cast your net over there. So then, all right, Lord. So they obey him. They cast their net over there. And then they can't even hardly pull up the fish because there's so many. They begin to break their nets. They begin to have issues trying to get the fish in the boat with them. So they should have learned, all right, we're going to take him at his word. So in one of these accounts, he also says, we're going to the other side. Because the Gadarene demoniacs on the other side waiting in need, in need of a touch of Jesus. In need of these demons being released off of him and out of him. So if Jesus says, we're going to the other side then they should have taken him at his word of saying, we're going to make it to the other side. <laughs> so their faith should have been built up in that, but they didn't. They had a fear. And then they, they, Jesus wakes up. They wake him up, and he, he looks at him and says, why are you fearful? Oh, you have little faith. Haven't you learned anything that I've taught you? Haven't you heard anything I've taught you the last, we would say chapters, but the last little bit? <laughs> Amen. This is why a rebuke is needed in this situation. Because sometimes... It may not be your pastor that rebukes you. It may be the Word that rebukes you. It may be the Holy Spirit that rebukes you. It may be God that rebukes you in some shape, form, or fashion. They say, come on now. You should know better than this. You should be built up in your faith more than this. You're to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. You're supposed to be a little higher on the faith totem pole, we'll say. I don't think it would be quite accurate, but it would be good there. But anyway, catch the heart of what I'm saying. You're supposed to be up a notch in your faith by listening to him and applying what he's teaching you, applying the word that's going into your life so you can take that next step up in your faith. Amen. So let's look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Oh, excuse me, let's go back. Right, let's finish out verse 27. Excuse me. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? So even the other men marveled. Not just, not just the disciples, it says, but the men. Because so far it says the disciples, the disciples, the disciples. Now it says, but the men. That means they all. They all marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? So even the other men who haven't been his disciples are taking note. Hey, when this man speaks, it has power. When this man speaks, it has authority. So don't you think that would have ratcheted their faith up in who he was? 
even not being his disciples, even not being with him with all this time yet. But they see that, wait a minute, he got up, he, rebu- he woke up from a nap, rebuked the storms, and the storms stopped. That would have caused their faith to grow in who Jesus was. But yet the disciples, being true Christians like today's modern Christians, they're not done yet. So let's go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Matthew 14, 22. And straightway, or we would say immediately, Jesus constrained or compelled his disciples to get into a ship to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Went up there by himself to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea. It was in the middle of the sea. Tossed with waves. Uh Uh-oh, here comes round two. Who's going to win? The waves or the disciples? (laughs) Tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. I've met some people like that. The wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch... Of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Now notice, they finally got the victory over the storms. But yet they see Jesus, and they think he's a ghost. And they get fearful of that. So it's like, come on, guys. Now granted, we may give them a hard time. We may rag them a little bit, but we're the same way. We finally get faith and victory over one area. Then it's all of a sudden something else happens and you're like, oh man, oh, what's going to happen now? It's like God's like, come on now. You, the winds, I would think that would be a bigger ordeal than seeing what they said was a ghost. Because we know there's no such thing as ghosts. Anyway, it's a whole other message for a different time. But it says, and when they saw, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a spirit or it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. So they got the faith, they got the victory over the issue with the waves. Praise God. That shows that they grew in their faith. But yet they still, in the midst of all of the storms, they still allowed something to trouble them and to put fear in them. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. (laughs) Take courage. It is I. Be not afraid. So again, he's telling them, look, don't be fearful. Don't be afraid. Take courage. It's okay. It's just me. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou. Now, I don't think a ghost would, would speak in Jesus' voice saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Or to take courage, it is I. I think a ghost, if, if, or what sorts of thing, or we'll say it's a demon, I don't think they're wanting to bring a peaceful, easy feeling. They're wanting to bring a fear and they was accomplishing this job if that would have been the case. But Jesus says take, he says, take courage. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And so Peter saying, All right, I'm going to make sure it's the Lord. He said, if it's you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So his faith is riding high right now. He said, Jesus said, come, I'm going. And so he begins to walk out on the water to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, but when he saw the wind boisterous, that means when he saw it violent, when he saw it mighty, when he saw it powerful, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, And said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So Jesus again rebukes him. Now granted, he may not be scolding him, but he's rebuking him. O ye of little faith. He didn't say, well, it's okay. You know, I know this storm is really something and you're now walking on the water and it's going to be okay. That's not what he says. He says, O ye of little faith. He says, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they came, they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. 
So Peter gets rebuked for placing his faith in what he sees rather than the storm, in the storm rather than what he sees in Jesus. So again, we see it's a lack of faith that causes this rebuke. It's a lack of faith that Jesus says, come on now, where's your faith? You should, you should have your faith be built up that you should have made it all the way to me. But wouldn't that preach for today? That many Christians, they see Jesus and they set out on the set out on the path of salvation, but then all of a sudden they see things around them start getting dark and they see the violence of culture. They see all the things that are around them that are trying to influence them and they give in to that and they lose their faith and they back off and they begin to sink in sin. They begin to sink in the things around them and not put their faith and trust in Jesus. That's dangerous. We're to keep our faith and we're to build up on our faith, not let our faith grow weak and not keep it the same. Because the faith that you had yesterday will not help you for today. The faith you had yesterday will not sustain you today. You've got to continue to build your faith each and every day by reading the Word, applying it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we hear the Word, we apply it to our life, it builds our faith, and we need more faith each and every day, especially because the days are getting darker and the end of time is drawing more near So we've got to be on our A game and building our faith each and every day. Amen. But we can't pay attention to the things around us and cause us to lose our faith or to have weak faith, a little faith according to Jesus. But we've got to stay focused on Him and what He has for us and Him calling us up higher, Him calling us to come out to Him to live our life and do the things that God wants us to do. Amen. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Let's start at verse 5. See, I tried to make it easy for you tonight. We just flipped through Matthew. Instead of going back and forth and all these other ones, we just continue through Matthew and read the same, same chapter, the same book, I should say. Matthew 16, verse 5. And when his disciples were come to the other side... They had forgotten to take bread. (laughs) Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. So again, they're focused on the natural and missing the whole point of the spiritual of what Jesus is saying. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? So again, it's because they're focused on the natural that they're, they've missed the whole spiritual aspect of what he's trying to teach them. We can't have just faith in what we see. We have faith in what we believe. So, well, that sounds like a verse. Yes, we walk by faith and not by sight. That's why we walk by faith. We walk by what we perceive, what we're being told by the Word of God. We, we walk by what God says and not what, by what we see. Because many times what you see is really an illusion. It's a mirage. You know, even if you, you know, find somebody that will say they, they look attractive, they act like they go to church, they have this Christianese speech coming out of their mouth, you may look at them and say, man, I'm going to marry them real quick. Then all of a sudden you get to know them and, no, 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 you start backpedaling. You're like, nope, 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 don't want none of this. Don't want none of this. Don't start backing up real quick. Because what you see can be deceiving. But when you walk by faith in the things of God, God reveals things to you and you speak to those things. And so we, we walk by our faith and not by what we see. We walk by the faith and faith comes by hearing the word of God, hearing the truth of God, applying it to our heart and our life and expounding upon those things and walking by those things. It's like right now that you're going through you know, bouts of sickness, things are coming around in our region and people are getting sick, things of that nature. We can either believe the symptoms and say, all right, this is, this is what I have, which is not bad. But you can say, all right, I've got to, it's going to be this many days before I get over it. I've got to do this many rounds of this, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. And you can believe the, that report, or you can walk by faith and say, you know what? This is maybe what the doctor said I have, but I believe and I speak in faith that I am the healed of God, that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm the, I'm the healed of God. My God's the God that heals me, and I declare my healing. 
and I'm walking by my faith, declaring my healing, then it won't take this long. I'll be of quick recovery, and then I will get everything I have need of. And it won't take me as long as it maybe does everybody else. It won't take me as long as what the doctor said. It won't take all of the things that I've got to go through because of the report that I received. But I walk by faith in declaring what the Word says over me, not by what I see and what the doctor has said. So the, the choice is ours. Which one are we going to believe? Which one are we going to do? Time for us to build our faith and to speak to things. And verse 7 again. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. In which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand? He says, don't you understand what I'm saying to you? Neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. He says, not once, but twice this happened. He says, are you missing the point? If we needed bread, God would supply our need. Taking us right back to Matthew 6. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your drink. Don't worry about your clothes. God will take care of it. Put him first. He'll supply all of your needs. So they're missing the point of what Jesus is saying. That's what he's rebuking. Because their faith is in what they can see and not what they declare. Not what God has told them. Not what Jesus Christ has told them. Verse 11. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? It would say the yeast. Yet understood, then understood, excuse me, they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of, of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So finally when Jesus rebukes them, they finally it's like a light bulb goes off. Oh, That's what he's talking about. Why? Because their faith was built up by hearing what Jesus said. Jesus kind of rebukes them. Oh, you have little faith. Then he says, don't you remember this? Don't you remember that? Come on now. You got to be with me. You got to stay with me. Stay with me in your faith. And him speaking to them because faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God because we know Jesus is the word made flesh. So when he speaks to them, it builds their faith. Oh, that's what that means. But it was because they heard what he said this time and not focused on the bread part, not focused on the natural part of it. They heard him for what he was really saying. Many times we can hear a preacher preach, and we'll hear a few words, and we'll say, man, okay, yeah. Or you can hear what the Lord is saying through that minister, through the word of God, and it really be built up in your faith. Really build your faith up because you're hearing the Word of God, not just nitpicking little things. Amen. So we've got to be careful that we truly, we don't become like the disciples and hearing only bits and pieces and applying it to a natural aspect and it does us no good, but we hear what the Spirit is really saying. We hear what God's really saying and apply it to our heart and life to build our faith. Oh yeah, amen, praise God. And it builds our faith to help us take on that next mountain. Amen. So Jesus rebukes their lack of faith, causing them... Jesus rebukes their lack of faith because they misunderstood what he was saying, because they only heard what he was saying naturally. So now let's look at Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. So we've seen multiple examples of Jesus rebuking his disciples when they were lacking faith or had little faith. And Jesus said, come on now, I've taught y'all better than this. You should have more faith than this. you got to understand what I'm saying. you got to understand the, the situation and what's really going on and not being fearful, not just focusing on the bread. you got to hear what I'm saying to you. So he would rebuke them. He says, I've taught you better than this. You should be a step higher than this in your faith. But for us, being on this side of the cross, we are not to rebuke those lacking faith. We're not to rebuke those lacking faith. Well, give me a verse for that, Pastor. We'll do. Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful uh, disputations. Let me read it from the New Living Translation. Accept, like accept, believe, 
I'm going to allow them to come in. Accept other believers who are weak in the faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Now, this verse does not say that you can't help teach them, that you can't speak to them and give them Scripture, things of that nature, but it says don't argue. Because arguing, even in, even in the Old Testament, it says if you rebu- rebuke a fool, fool and you'll get a black eye. Rebuke a wise man, and he'll love you for it. He'll appreciate you for it. But rebuke a fool, and you'll get a black eye. That means if you rebuke him, you argue with him, he's not going to take it well because he's a fool. He doesn't want to be made fun of. He doesn't want to be told that he's wrong, so he'll punch you. <laughs> but it says here, it says, accept other believers who are weak in faith. Bring them into the house of God so that they may hear the word of God and their faith be built. But don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. There are times people will bring me something. And they'll say, well, I believe in this, Pastor. I believe in that, Pastor. And I believe in this. And I'll, there's sometimes I'll maybe throw a couple of scriptures out there to kind of help them maybe see a different perspective. And there's other times I just smile and nod. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's, that's neat. That's neat. Why? Because I'm not going to argue with them. Because it may be something that great-grandma told them. And because in my mind, I'm thinking, you can't show up to church on time. You can't do this. You can't do that. I'm, you're weak in the faith because you don't have your faith set on being here on time. You don't have your faith set on doing the other things that we talk about regularly in our church services. So I don't have, I don't have biblical right to argue with you about this. I'm not going to argue. I might give you a scripture or two to help you see a little bit differently. But if you're going to be immature in this area of your walk with God, I can't expect you to be mature enough to handle when I'm going to plow you crossways about your little pet doctrine or pet thing that you have to say about it. (laughs) That's the response I thought I would get. But we can see that we're not to argue with others when it comes to things, because especially those who are weak in faith. We can... As we said, we can train them, we can give them scripture, we can do things to try to help them to understand the bigger picture or to understand it accurately, but we don't argue. Because arguing will, may even just push them away from the faith. Because there are people that have that testimony of, I used to go to church and I was trying to understand this, trying to understand that, and then people wanted to argue with me. And I just got tired of it and I just, I just left. I just didn't want to argue with people anymore. I was just trying to understand I was just trying to learn. It's like, man. Now granted, it's their own fault. They could have either found another church. They could have tried to handle it differently. But how many people's bloods are going to be on others' hands because they wanted to argue and prove that they were right rather than fulfilling this verse and saying, well, let me teach you. Let's not argue about it. Let's teach about it. Let's talk about it. Let's pull what the Word has to say. That we can agree in this together. We can be like the Bereans. We'll go home, study it out. Let me study out what you've said. You can study out what I've said, and we can come back together, and we can work it out. We can hammer it out doctrinally. But you don't find that anymore because that takes maturity. It takes people having their own walk with God, being built up in their faith of what the Word says, not what men say. Because nowadays you find the, the average Christian only goes to church for about 30, 45 minutes Maybe an hour if they got good songs <laughs> and a light show. But they only go for the church for an hour and they hear what their pastor says and they never go and walk with their God for themselves. Because I mean, they, they, they're not taught any different. Oh, I go, I go, I got to be part of this. I got to be inclusive to be in part of this group and I get to go to heaven. No, no, no. That sounds like church Christ. But it's in your modern mega churches or wannabe mega churches. Well, you come connect with us. We're all going to heaven. Just because you connect with somebody doesn't mean you're going to heaven. You got to connect with God. You got to have a relationship through Jesus Christ with God the Father to make heaven. The Bible states that very clearly. But anyway, but that would require a maturity to be able to discuss things, to be able to learn and to grow, to hear the word of God and apply it and build your faith. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Only a couple more verses will be done for tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 
1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 8. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith, wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is, which is lacking in your faith. Now God Himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end He may, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. So seeing this, going back up to verse 8, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. That means you've got to stand fast means your faith has got to be rooted and grounded in God, in the Lord Jesus, that you're not easily shaken, you're not easily moved. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly. So the Apostle Paul is praying night and day exceedingly that we may see your face, that I may come to you is what he's saying. And might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So in other words, Paul says, I know there's things lacking in your faith. I know there's things missing. And he says, and I'm praying night and day that I can come to you and help you build up your faith, help you to fill in these holes that are missing in your faith. Now again, he's not rebuking them. He's not saying, well, you guys should know better. Oh, hey, I got to come again to you guys. I'm praying I can make it because I got to teach you guys because obviously y'all are stupid and you're not picking it up the first time. That's not what he's saying. He's not rebuking them. He's saying, I'm praying that I can come and I can help you, that I can teach you, that I can be with you in person, and that I can help fill in the areas that are lacking in your faith, that are missing. That way you're not, you're not lacking in any area of your faith, any area of your life. I can come and help you and to teach you to build those things up. Because Paul knows that faith comes by hearing. Now granted, he could write the letter to them like he does, like he does through all the epistles. But he's saying it would be better for me to come to you in person. That way as you have questions, I can answer them. You can hear what I'm saying to you and build up your faith. Instead of having to wait for the, the letters to go back and forth and to, to make their way. He said, I can come to you and perfect and mature that which is lacking in your faith. So disciple makers are to help mature everyone under them by teaching and helping, but not arguing. You teach and help and don't argue. <laughs> so just as much as the disciple maker teaches and helps and doesn't argue, it would not be beneficial for the disciple to be able to not listen, to not receive the help, and to argue. Because you're defeating the whole purpose. So when we work together, when one submits, listens, and is teachable, and the other one is teaching and helping and not arguing, you can see that there is a harmony in that, and that's the way that the process is supposed to go to help benefit the body of Christ, to help benefit every believer. This is the reason discipleship is so important, and you don't see it much anymore. Many people think that just, oh, I, I go to that church over there and that preacher, he, he disciples me by preaching me the word. That's not discipleship. I would dare say that's probably, we'll be gracious and say it's 5% discipleship. That's being gracious. Because that is using the word of God to instill in something into you. But true discipleship is being that one-on-one. -on -one. I like what Dr. Barclay says, disciples are made around the campfire. That doesn't mean the multitude's there. That means the disciples have taken the time out to be around the campfire, around the disciple maker, to hear what they've got to say. Some of my favorite times and the most times I, the, what I learned the most or when I learned the most around my pastor is the intimate times where it's just maybe he and I or maybe he, he and I and a few, you know, handful of other guys. And also around with Dr. Barclay. Dr. Barclay do special sessions where it's some of us pastors and maybe a handful of us and maybe we were getting coffee or doing other things, that is when I learned the most. Now granted, I could take 
pages worth of notes and stuff from listening to them preach, but the more intimate details, the more things that has gripped my life as being in those one-on-one sessions or being in just a handful of guys, as Dr. Barclay says, around the campfire, so to speak, that you really catch the heart of a disciple maker and it changes your life the most. So, but what does, that, what does that entail, though? That entails you putting faith and saying, I believe, Father God, I believe Jesus, I believe by the Holy Spirit, I was led here to be under this disciple maker, and I'm putting my faith because in you to receive everything that I have need from this disciple maker. That you have called me here, so my faith is here, and I'm putting my faith in here and what they've got to say to benefit my life. Not just because they give me the word, but because they give me testimonies. They give me the things coming from the word and from what you have done in their life to help benefit me. That still requires faith all the way around. It's not just faith in a person because people are going to do you wrong. People are humans. In some shape, form, or fashion, they're going to eventually let you down. They may not answer a text. They may not answer a call. They may have a bad day and... and you know, maybe gripe or complain at you or say something snippy that they don't mean to just because they're having a bad day, whatever the case may be. But the Word of God and putting our faith in Him, knowing that He has called us to a, he called us to a person or called us to a church to be discipled there, that is where we still have to have our faith. Amen. But it requires no arguing on either side, but to teach and to be taught, to help and to receive the help. And that's what makes the kingdom of God grow. And as some disciples, as they grow, then they're sent out to make disciples of others. Technically, we're all supposed to make disciples according to the Great Commission. But it's one of those things to where if you quit receiving and quit being a disciple, then you can only give of what you have. And if you haven't grown that much, you don't have much to offer. Unless you go back and build your faith in where God has called you, who to be under, then you can continue to feed yourself by the people that God has put into your life, and you can continue to give that out and to continue to be accurate in your discipleship. Amen. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read two verses. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. So we've looked at a lack of faith causes a rebuke by Jesus Christ. Those that are lacking faith now, we don't argue. We would say we, we don't argue with them, but we can give them the word. We can teach and help. But now for us tonight to kind of close this Maybe this teaching or message out, we need to examine our faith. Where are we at on this scale? Where are we at? Do we, is there areas that we can come up in? Is there areas that maybe we need to, to receive the help and receive the discipleship? Because I, I think there's parts of our faith where we could all do that. But are we causing arguments? Are we trying to say, no, 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 I'm right, you're wrong? <laughs> kind of examine our faith in that regard. Where are we at according to tonight's message and what can we do to take that next step in our faith. So 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. There's a lot of selves in here. You'd think this was a seeker-friendly verse. There's a lot of selfishness in here. <laughs> but that's not what it's talking about. It says examine yourself, prove yourself. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Now I'm going to read from the New Living Translation that same verse. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Mm. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Mm. I'm going to read that again. New Living Translation. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. So that's where we need to start with our examination. Lord, is my faith in you or is it in my religiosity? Is my faith in my relationship 
with God through Jesus Christ, or is it in just the doing of being religious? Then it says, test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. So if He's among you, you're professing and really walking with Him, you're going to know that He's there. But if not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Verse 6. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. New Living Translation, that same verse. As ye test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. So in other words, examining your faith will also help display the godly leaders in your life. Because if you're just under so-and-so, because we'll say under megachurch Tommy. We'll just give him a nickname. I don't know. I'm just kind of making stuff up. Uh, if, you're, if you're under the discipleship of megachurch Tommy, then if you really start examining your faith and it doesn't have much to it, you're lacking faith and Jesus Christ would rebuke you if you were around him, then that shows that who you're around is not helping you build your faith. They're not teaching you and building your faith in different areas. They're not helping you come up to that next level of faith. But it's also condemning because why isn't it in you to come up? Why isn't it in you to seek what the next step is? I mean, most of us, if we work a job, we're wanting to say, all right, what's it going to require of me to take it to the next step to receive a promotion? What, what do I need to learn that when I, so I can get ready for that next step? When the boss is looking for somebody else to promote to the level above me, that I can say, all right, I've learned that, I've learned that, I've learned that, I'm ready. You just got to give me the word go and promote me and we're ready to go. I've already learned it. So we understand that in the natural, but where is that in the spiritual? Because if that was the case of most Christians, most Christians wouldn't go to a mega church. Because there's no discipleship. There's no testing and trying of your faith. There's no examining yourself. It's all about, well, what can I get today? What latte can I get? What flavored donut can I get? What sin can I commit before anybody finds it out? And not by the Holy Ghost pastor, but by everybody seeing me and this whatever sleeping together. (laughs) There's no discipleship in that. Well, yeah, it is. It's discipleship of the devil. Anyway, but you examine your faith, and that will that will show you, first of all, who is around you that is a real godly leader trying to help you take that next step in your faith. And it also is it is that hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God in you creating a desire to go to the next level. So it's kind of twofold. It's one, examine yourself to say, Why isn't that hunger in me? Or if it is, praise God. Then the next step would be, as the godly leaders, the ones I declare my godly leaders around me, are they calling me higher? And if they are, and I'm not listening to that call, why am I not obeying that call? Why am I not taking the step up? Amen. So examining our faith. So praise God. So let's not lack faith that Jesus Christ or the Word of God would have to rebuke us. But let's also not rebuke others who are new to the faith, or we would say lacking faith, but let's teach them and help them and be disciple makers to them. But let's also start with our own selves that we examine our faith to see where we're at. If our faith is genuine, if we're listening to the leaders that God has in our lives to call us up higher. Because I'm reminded of Scripture, it says that it's an upward calling. It's an upward calling, not a Stay on the same plane calling. It's an upward calling. We go, go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. That's to go up the ladder, so to speak. We don't stay the same. Amen. Amen.